So we are going to now hear from one of our uh, producers in the fiber shed community who is in the Cape Hay Valley. And she has been classically breeding cotton for, I believe it's three decades. Yes. yes. And uh, Sally Fox is, um, to everyone's kind of agreed definition at this point, a pioneer. Um, yarn has been named after her in this vein. <laughs> And so we are just so pleased to be able to hear from her directly and hear about, in context of what you've just heard, to hear um, another way of honing in on traits that are viable for our fiber shed communities um, within plants. And so thank you so much for coming today. Appreciate it. Oh yeah, I need to be able to. And then this. And this. I supposed to talk within two inches. Right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. Can you hear me? Am I within my two inches? Is this better? Okay, good. Okay, well, I know this is the wool symposium, and I am wearing my own wool from my own sheep, um, knit by Mariah, um, my own design. Um, and it is how I fund all these fun and games that I will show you. Mm -hmm. I sell the products of my farm. And funding is always this big issue. How do we support our, our, our work? And we all figure out our ways. Um, my way has been uh, really simple. I just produce things, sell them, and <laughs> use money to do my research. So this is it. Um, I'm talking about breeding in the one plant I've bred since 1981, okay? So I started out being the nematologist, entomologist for, for a plant breeder. Back then, there was no genetic engineering. In fact, the plant breeder I worked for hated genetic, they were, it was a new thing, genetic engineering, and the plant breeders generally had great disdain for these guys. And um, he was an entertaining character. He was in his 70s and I was 20 something. And I grew vast vats of nematodes to take the breeding lines that he was developing and test them. And then I became his pollinator. And through him, I learned the skills of plant breeding. But plant breeding, especially cotton breeding, was so boring, I went back to entomology with the exception of this, of this cotton that I fell in love with. And that is cotton that grows in color. Um, this is a little background. I worked my way through college teaching hand spinning, and one of my favorite students was an, uh, oh, maybe 40 years older than I, 50 years older than I was, and she had a daughter who had become, uh, who was in a nursing home. Her brain had been destroyed by handling dyes. She was a high school textile teacher, and she hadn't worn gloves. And she was sticking her hands into the dye uh, stuffs with her students. And the, the metals migrated to her brain, and she was essentially brain dead. And this is back before we had our Google and our iPhones. And I remember going to the library at Cal Poly and looking up dyes, thinking, well, what in the world would who, who even thinks about this sort of a thing? And so I'm looking around, and I had studied entomology. Because not, I was, my original goal was to be a custom hand spinner. I used to sit in the windows of dog grooming shops and spin people's yarn. And this is what I was going to do, but then I had a teacher from Kenya who implored me to study entomology and be part of the group of people who would reduce pesticide use by informed ways of controlling pests pest management that was responsible and lower toxicity exposure to people this way. So that's why I was studying entomology. That's why I was teaching hand spinning to work my way through. And the teacher, um, so I was already a fanatic against pesticides. And so I opened this book, these books to find out who's make, who makes dyes. And it turns out they're the same companies. In fact, these companies that made pesticides all started out by making dyes. That was the first profitable business they had, and then they went into pesticides. So, okay, I'm never going to use dyes. I'm just going to use natural colors of natural fibers. And back then, there were no wonderful vendors everywhere selling fibers, so 
San Francisco Zoo used to let me go in and collect the muskox hair, and they used to let me collect the camel hair, and so I was always doing all this natural spinning of dyeing, not dyeing, natural colors of natural fibers. So when I was in this greenhouse, and he had this, I opened a drawer one day, and there's this bag of seeds of colored <coughs> cotton. Ha! Finally, cotton that has something more, that, it's so dull, boring, white, that you have to dye. And I hated dyes, right? So, um, and, I, and there weren't all these magnificent natural dyers everywhere then. It was a new thing. It very requires more skills than I have. So I was always sticking to the natural colors of natural fibers. And here is this finally some color in cotton because we all know there's all these beautiful colors of wool and, and all these other animals but boring cotton. So I said to him, hey, why don't we bring that? First of all, this is a beautiful color, but what a lousy fiber. It was really rough and it was short and it was hard to spin and I was a good spinner. So I said, hey, why don't we breed this cotton to make it better? And he said, there's no market for colored cotton. And I said, oh, let's, let's make a market for colored cotton. <laughs> he starts laughing and he says, okay, you, you can make a market for colored cotton in your own time and you ha can have all this greenhouse space. So that's how it all started. And I, my goal was how do I get this fiber to be better to spin? And not only better to spin, but it turned out better to grow. So um, originally I started out, boy, I really need to move this so I can see, because I have to see the pictures. How do you get a fiber how do you get a crop that was too tall and produced only flowered in the, when the day and the night were the same number of hours, giving you no crop? How do you get a crop to be like that to go into being a normal cotton crop that someone can pick with a machine? So this takes breeding, and that's what I do. And I just want to, I know I don't have all this time, but here's a picture of whole fields that I bred. I bred this cotton to be grown and machine picked and be able to be machine spun and be able to be washed. These are big deals because what I started with, when you washed it, the color washed out. And the plants, as you saw, were really huge and tall, beautiful for a garden, but not appropriate for a farm. Um, so how do you get there? And what you, this is kind of industrial scale so that it can make a difference because remember, first I was going to save the world from pesticides and then I was going to save the world from dyes. Okay, so <laughs> the goals are high. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm just showing you a picture of me and my youth with my aunt who inspired me and her, my name, my middle name, Versis, was her name. She's who I was named after and she inspired me always to go for the best good. She was a radical feminist nun, and she, <laughs> and she inspired a lot of women to go for, um, their, go for having lives of meaning. Um, so I, I'm gonna go really fast. So these are cotton flowers. On the left is the main species of cotton grown um, called Gossypium hirsutum. That's the fuzzy seeded cotton that has a fuzzy seed that the the Eli Whitney gin made possible to produce on a large scale. On the right is Gossypium barbadense, and that's the species that is Pima cotton, Sea Island cotton, and Egyptian cotton. The barbadense has the extremely long fibered lines. The hirsutum is where I, my first colors came from, and they were really short. So I crossed these two species. This is not uncommon in plant breeding to if you're, if they, I don't really know why they call them separate species, but they do sort out to, the, to their types. This is a cotton flower. It's very simple. The, the thing sticking up, I don't know if there's a pointer here. There's a stigma sticking up. That's the female portion. And the pollen is that orange stuff on the bottom. And cotton is so easy to breed. You just take the pollen off the night before the flower is going to open and be fertile. You remove the pollen the night before, and the next day you bring the pollen what you want. Uh, and then you, wait a minute, then you, there's a picture of me making a, a certain cross in 1985. And that is the basis of, uh, it turns out that that picture was something, because that cross was a very big deal. I'll tell you more about it later. Okay, so 
On the left is the, in this case, the mother. On the right is the father, and the baby is in the middle. And they call the baby an F1. And it goes F1, F2, F3. So when you're breeding, you just cross, you make crosses, you get seeds. Um, you take the seeds from that cross, you plant them. The plant that grows up, in this case, had a flower that looked like that. And the fiber that looked, whoops, sorry. The fiber, um, well, there's flowers, more breeding. Okay, you put a little tag on the, on the pole to know that that's the one you crossed. And you save those seeds and you plant them up. And in that case, that beautiful flower produced that cotton bowl with those seeds. There are about eight seeds per section. So you take, in this case, eight times four, you have, you know, maybe you have 20 seeds from your F1 and you plant them up in a little plot and those plant, you grow those plants up, you save those seeds from the, those 20 plants and you grow them into a plot. And plots here are separated. This is little young plants in a plot. You grow all those out. Each generation, you grow plots. Um, one plant might produce a hundred seeds and you at that point you begin to have the capacity to select individual plants. So why do you make F1 crosses in the first place? You make them to invite, diver, uh, invite expression. The plant's chance to do something new is in is when you make these crosses. You give the plants the chance to say it wants to be something new, it wants to be something different. And you, the breeder, are the one that gets to be the one to look at them all and decide who am I gonna save? Whose seeds will I save and bring forward the next year? How many skeins of yarn can I sell to pay for these plots? Because most every one of these plants I don't save the cotton from. They go goes back into the soil. Maybe one out of a hundred out of five hundred plants do you save the seeds of. So it's very ruthless. You're walking along and you love these guys and you can't <laughs> save their seeds. But you take do save the best ones. You think they're the best ones. You hope they're the best ones. And you hope if you've made mistakes, you get redeemed somehow. So you, this is your deal. You do this, I've been doing this since 1981, okay? So you get to work, where, how come it won't go? Let's see, what am I doing wrong? There, okay, so you, I can't see these so well, but I'm just trying to go fast because I don't, I didn't get hours here. If you want me to speak for hours, we'll do it another way, okay? <laughs> um, I have lots of plants that separate my plots. I just showed this because one year I had all these plots and some kids at the grammar school or high school did a prank and they came out and took all my little sticks away that separated the plots. And so after that, I decided, luckily I had a map and of my, in those days there were thousands of plots every year. And then I started putting sunflowers and Milo and different plants in between the plots. So if anybody made this their prank, I still would know where one plot ended and another began. So, I don't know, here we go, there. Um, plots, flowers. Okay, I'm gonna briefly show you beautiful flowers. I'm gonna show you flowers because I can't show you the differences in the fiber. But the most variability happens in the F2 generation. That's where you get the most amazing variability. And so these are all pictures of F2 flowers. So you can see how different, these are plants, and each one of these plants will have different flowers and it's my chance to show you that there is enormous diversity released when you breed the old-fashioned way of cross-pollinating when you breed you can get all this variability then then you um, I'm just showing you more pictures and then here are some colors of cotton of course the color is is the main thing but the fiber has to be spinnable the you have to be able to wash the clothes and they get, and the color doesn't wash out. And you have to be able to wear it and feel comfortable. It can't be rough, at least in my opinion, it can't be rough. I'm breeding for what I think is important. Every breeder breeds for what they think is important, with the exception of if you work for somebody, which most people do. 
they don't get to do everything they want. They have to breed for what their university tells them. They have to breed for what their boss tells them. They have to breed for what the farmers tell them. So most cotton breeders bred for farmers. You usually sell your seeds to farmers. And all farmers care about is yield. So everyone breeds for the coarsest fiber they can get away with because it's the easiest way to get the yield up. So um, lucky for me, uh, I have never had, the, had that. No one has been, <laughs> I breed the cotton, I grow the cotton, I contract with farmers to grow it by the acre. No way is somebody gonna tell me they want higher yield because then they're gonna have this rough stuff that you have to use enzymes to soften up. If you, the breeder, the only other country in the world, only other breeders I know of that breed for fineness are the Greeks. They breed for fineness because the EU pays per acre for the cotton and not by the pound. And therefore the Greek mills have the best fiber because their breeders have been breeding for fineness, which is the most important quality other than color in my opinion. So um, I know I'm running out of time. So normal breeders, I'm just gonna show you variability even in white. This is, there's so much variability in cotton and there's so much variability in every single product we breed and grow. And it's from that variability that we get to choose what, which way are we going? Which way are we going? Are we producing things that are enlivening our earth and us? Or are we stuck with being short-sighted and having to breed for the next year's seed sales? And most, there, I haven't ever, I haven't met any independent plant breeders. There are very few of them anymore. Most everybody is contracted to work for some, either a, a big company like Monsanto or something, they hire plant breeders or they have their own, or the universities, um, they are dictated what to do by what grants they get. And so I, despite living hand to mouth and very humbly, I still have, manage to be able to do my own science. And that's really, you know, what it's about. I have a completely serious system of evaluating my lines and I've made massive, been able to watch the cotton make massive changes and improvements in its, in its evolution. So plant breeding is being a partner in the plant's evolution. It's not being the, it can be, if you're the sort of a person that you're some sort of a dictator, you can become, it's not as though plant breeding is free of the potential of abuse. It can be. There are these people who use all these like uh, chemicals that cause mutations and send seeds out into the, onto the space shuttle to get it irradiated to make to make more diversity from which they can choose. So it's not as though one system is necessarily some purely good system. I think it's about the person doing it. And if you as a person are a person interested in partnerships versus domination, it's going to have a different uh, uh, effect. And so one of the mo my motivations for not giving up all these years is because I do believe that the approach of cooperation matters, even in something like this, even in inviting diversity from plants and selecting the ones that I feel are the best for whatever reason. So I'm going to not do the rest of my slides and say thank you for having me and, um, and I can answer questions. I'm in the Cape Bay Valley. Is that California? California, yeah. I was, um, my cotton, this cotton got outlawed twice in the San Joaquin Valley. It was outlawed, so I moved to Arizona. And then in Arizona, it got quarantined. Um, they gave, 
the, the, the director of agriculture called and said, well, the legislature has the votes to outlaw all organic farming in Arizona, but really what they want to do is get rid of you. So can we just sort of come up with some rules and regulations to make them feel like they have you cornered and leave organic alone for the rest of the farmers? So I said yes, and I went in, and we came up with all these, OK, my cotton had to be three miles from somebody else's seed fields, that kind of a thing. So as soon as these regulations were in place, one of the big seed companies put their seed field 2.9 miles away from my farm and I had to move. And that's why I'm in the Cape Valley. I moved to a place where there's no cotton and only organic farmers who are nice to me. Very nice to me. <laughs> and that was 19 years ago. Could you say something about what your picture is going forward with your plant breeding work and how people can support you? So the question is, what's, my vi what's the vision going forward? Well, OK, so every single color has a different hard thing for it to do. It's really hard for green. It was, green was short and weak and low yielding. I've improved the length and the strength. Um, on a, a one in a million crossing over thing, I got one out of, I, I only had to grow 800,000 plants to get that one in a million. That was a big deal. And that happened in 1992. And that was from that cross that I showed you the picture of. That was a descendant of that particular cross, which is so interesting because I've done maybe 10,000 crosses, if not more, of individual flowers. So it's, so I keep wondering, should photographers come around and take pictures of me making crosses? Maybe that's the <laughs> ticket to having this one in a million thing happen, you know? So back to the, the thing is, every color has a different thing that it's hard for it. Green, I'm still working on yield. I've gotten the strength and the, and the length up and intensity of color, but yield is its hard thing. Red, the hardest thing with red was the color uh, washed and tinted but not dyed anything else, just making it irritating and useless because it washed out. So in that case, I had 180 some individual plants that I had selected and I took, I spun a single of the red and a single of the white and plied it and boiled each one and one plant didn't die, wash out, uh, boil out. One plant is the foundation of this Sierra Sienna. I called it Sierra Sienna because Sierra, who many of you know, helped me for years coming out and weeding and planting. And her hair, this color is so much like her hair. So I have a few cones. I got 40 pounds of it spun that she helped in and we sent it. And so I have it over there. So I keep working on each color has a different thing that it's hard for it to do and to get there, you have to make crosses and grow the plots and do this work. It's just work. And I support it by selling all these products. You can go to my website, versice.com. That was my, that picture of my aunt. Her name was Versice. It's my middle name. If you Google Sally Fox, you'll see this funny versice.com. And it looks real professional. You would never know it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm the one who fills the orders. I have two hour, one to two hours of help a day. That's it. So it's very, uh, uh, I've hung on by the support of the community. All of you, maybe not all of you, but many of you support me. You buy my yarns. They may not even be the best yarns, but you buy them anyway. <laughs> and you're there, and you encourage me. And this matters. It really matters. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.